Well, happy 245th birthday to the United States of America. I still wish we had some fireworks around here, <laughs> but I guess we'll have to watch PBS. Um, I have dual citizenship. I'm an American and I'm a citizen of Zion, the kingdom of heaven. And one is far more important than the other. And I appreciate so much those songs. Thank you, Michael. Spot on in terms of the theme of the lesson. I can always tell when a when a song leader pays attention and, and picks songs that, that go with that, that sermon. Andrea and I, have, I've said many times, have different colored passports, and she carries a blue one, and I carry, or I carry a blue one, she carries a red one. And her daughters have three passports, although I think they need to update one or two of them. <laughs> but uh, they have a Seychelles, Seychelles passport, Seychelles Wa. They have a German passport. They were born in Germany and have a German mother. They have... Uh, had an American father, and uh, um, so they have the, the United States passport. And um, I know some of you are naturalized citizens. You've come from other countries, and you've become Americans, maybe even renounced your citizenship somewhere else to be able to declare your loyalty to the United States of America, its government, and its constitution. And so I want to talk just a, a few minutes about citizenship this morning. Paul mentions that he was a Roman citizen in the Acts of the Apostles. And he mentions that he's a citizen of heaven in Philippians 3. And so he was a dual citizen too. But what does that mean anyway? in terms of, of how we live our lives in the here and now. I'd like to explore that for just a, a few minutes today. Number one, it involves a certain kind of, of heritage. I am uh, happy to be an American. I, I root for Americans, particularly in, in soccer. I like that sport like the American national teams, especially when they win. Uh, I suppose if I watch any of the Olympics this summer, that uh, I'll root for some of the Americans. And I've been tremendously blessed. Um, I can... Uh, You know, sing along to a, a song like Born in the USA or Proud to be an American or one of my favorites was produced during the uh, Second World War, sung by Kate Smith. It's an old Irving Berlin tune that goes like this, God bless America land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam, God bless America, my home sweet home. God bless America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night from the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. And uh, I, I think I could pray that uh, out of concern for my land. I'm not always proud to be an American these days. Um, seems like things are sometimes a mess. And there are... Uh, ideas put forth in the public space that, that I cannot personally endorse, that are held to be American values, and so on. 
but I'm, I'm very thankful uh, to have grown up in a country that, um, and, and I thought about doing this maybe toward the end of the, of the church history lessons next quarter, just, just by way of, of passing, because I, I think a lot of people are, are completely unaware of the uniqueness of the American experiment. I'm not trying to bring government or Americana into the pulpit uh, other than just to say this, that I'm not sure that we fully realize what we've got and how blessed we really are, even when things are far less than perfect. Um, do you realize that the many of the people that came over here were religious nuts, religious fanatics who wanted to escape oppression from other lands and therefore it was it was embedded deeply into their DNA that if we ever create a new system, it has to have checks and balances that protect the conscience of each individual, particularly when it comes to the worship of Almighty God. And that is some, somewhat unique, whether we realize it or not, or not, somewhat unique in the history of the world that they launched this experiment in which they would say things like, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evil, evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. So embedded deeply from the very beginning was this idea of individual and religious liberty from tyrannical government built into the DNA of the American spirit. Was it perfect? No, never was. It's not now, it never was. In fact, um, slavery, for example, was a black eye. Uh, they were preaching one thing and practicing something else. But growing out of the American experience uh, and the DNA that was there, for better or for worse, were the ideas of American ingenuity and the famous rugged individualism of American self-consciousness to protect individual freedoms with checks and balances so that you wouldn't have tyrannical government um, that would uh, not recognize the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion and the idea of the freedom of assembly and so on. I don't know that our Pledge of Allegiance uh, is something I can say is absolutely true anymore. Uh, uh, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. To me, that's an ideal. I would like it to be true, and I would pray for it to be true. And to the extent that it's not true, um, I would hope and pray for better things. 
We have a national motto engraved even on coins. This, again, is somewhat unique. You go to other countries, you're not going to see this motto engraved on coins. In God we trust. And so there are some blessings that, that grow out of, of that that I'm very, very thankful for. And um, to the extent that they may be in jeopardy, I would pray for our country for the sake of kids and grandkids and and others that they might have the same blessings that I kind of took for granted. But be that, uh, be that as is, there's this culture that, that shapes my identity. And when I travel abroad to a foreign land and see a fellow American, I, I have something in common uh, that immediately I recognize. And, uh, and I'm not ashamed of wearing the, the red, white, and blue. And I've got that, that common heritage with those other Americans and the uniqueness of the, of the American experience of uh, the old Superman shows, Truth, Justice, and the American Way. And again, that's, America's far from perfect and never was and, and is not now. And so, but it's, I, I am concerned not for what it is, but for what I want it to be. And so when I look back on, on founding principles, uh, Ben Franklin said, whoever shall introduce into public affairs the, the principles of primitive Christianity will change the face of the world. Or John Adams, suppose, suppose a nation in some distant region, and he's not even assuming this is true of America. It never was absolutely true of America. He wanted it to be true, but he said, just suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only law book and every member should regulate his conduct by the precepts there exhibited. Every member would be obliged in conscience in to temperance, frugality, and industry, to justice, kindness, and charity towards his fellow man, to piety, love, and reverence toward Almighty God. What a utopia. What a paradise this region would be. Everybody regulated content or conduct by, by the Bible. If everyone, if everyone were a Christian, I think life would be a little bit different, don't you think? And that's not the utopia we're living in, for sure. But it's an ideal that is worth dreaming about maybe but we're never going to have it here in full which is why i carry another passport that is infinitely more important than my blue one because uh this other passport gets me into heaven and that citizenship is so much more important to me than my American citizenship. And, and that kingdom is absolutely perfect. And sometimes I'm ashamed of some things that are associated with America, but I'll never, ever be ashamed of my citizenship in Zion. I have nothing to be ashamed of there. And so in Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, beginning with verse 18, the writer says, for you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them for they could not endure the order that was given. If even, even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who were enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood 
that speaks of a better word uh, than the blood of Abel. Verses 28 and 29, he says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. And so I, I think that uh, we need to be concerned about uh, certain betterment of principles here in the temporary land in which we're living. Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew 6, verse 10. Your will be done on heaven or on earth as it is in heaven, Matthew 6 and verse 10. And we read in, in Proverbs 14, verse 34, that righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people. So it's not like I'm unconcerned about what goes on here. I am, and I pray for it, pray for better conditions. But I have a common history and heritage that is so much more important than the red, white, and blue one. It's far more significant. And um, even though I see great evil sometimes in American institutions and American values, I'm in the world, but not of the world. I'm in America, but I'm not of America. And ultimately, I'm not an American, even though I was born here. I belong to God's kingdom, first and foremost. And there's nothing about that that's cringeworthy. Nothing. That doesn't mean I'm totally unconcerned for what goes on here. Again, I think we need to pray. Um, I've got many passages listed there, but one of the most important is Jeremiah 29, verse 7. And God is telling the Judahites through Jeremiah the prophet that you're going to go into Babylonian captivity and you're going to be there a while. Babylon was no godly place. It was quite the opposite. It was ungodly. But interestingly enough, when the Judahites were told you're going to go into Babylonian captivity and you're going to be there a while, 70 years. Verse 7 of Jeremiah 29 says, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray the Lord on its behalf. In its welfare, you will find your welfare. That passage, along with a, a multitude of other passages, teaches me that just because I am first and foremost concerned about the kingdom of God doesn't mean I'm totally unconcerned about what goes on here. You seek the welfare of the land to which I'm sending you. You pray for it. In its welfare, you will find welfare. And so for that reason, I obey the governing authorities and I pay taxes. Romans 13, 1, 6, and 7. For that reason... I pray for the authorities and for leaders, even when I don't agree with them always. 1 Peter chapter 2, 13 through 17 says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. This is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. It might not be easy to honor the emperor if you've received this epistle for the very first time, if the emperor's name is Nero. I don't always agree with the politicians that are put in positions of responsibility in the United States of America or the state of California or the county of Santa Clara, but I pray for them. And I'm gonna urge every one of you to pray for them, whether you agree with them or not. They need your prayers. 
And if I understand 1 Timothy chapter 2 correctly, it's the answer to those prayers that will fully enable us to do what God wants us to do, to open up doors of opportunity that otherwise would be closed. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and acceptable in sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And so you want the gospel to have free course? Then pray for those in authority so that those doors of opportunity can be opened and we can do in a peaceful society what we need to do as Christians to get the message out so that people can be saved. It's not about, I like this political philosophy or I like that political philosophy. It's about the kingdom, folks. The kingdom of God and being able to do what God wants us to do. That's why we need to pray for earthly rulers. Paul was concerned about his fellow Jews. And some of them were rotten. There were Jews in Paul's time that were absolutely corrupt. But this is what Paul says about his fellow Jews. He says in Romans chapter 9 and verse 3, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. I'll tell you something. Challenge you with something. Do you love your fellow Americans like that? Even the ones with whom you profoundly disagree? Love them enough to sacrifice your own skin for them? Or chapter 10 in verse 1. He says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Do you love your fellow citizens in this country enough to sacrifice your own standing to, to get the gospel message out in their best interest because you love your neighbor as yourself? Those are questions I think we need to ask ourselves. In Isaiah 62, verses 6 and 7, we read, on your walls of Jerusalem, I've set a watchman all the day and all the night. They shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in all the earth. Do you give God no rest until he makes Zion a praise in all the earth? Because our more important allegiances are spiritual in nature. My greatest sacrifices are not going to be for the United States of America. They're going to be for the kingdom of God. Seek the kingdom first and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. Matthew 6 and verse 33. My obedience, my loyalty, my, my prayer for my fellow citizens of the kingdom of heaven, the soldiers of the cross stationed all over the world for the, the noble cause that heavenly citizenship places in our hearts means that even though we, we may pray for the earthly rulers and the earthly first responders and the earthly police force, and I, I, I pray for all of these. And I, we need more good people. We need more Scott Wilsons in the Santa Clara police force. It's a good man. And we need to be praying for them. But you know what I really want us to pray for? Is for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who will have an influence on this wicked world no matter where they are found, whether they are Americans or not. 
And we should not rest until the church of our Lord is victorious over the gates of Hades and all the enemies of the cross are extinguished and the truth of God reigns supreme. And a longing for home. Whenever I'm in a foreign country and uh, it, it's finally time to get on the plane and uh, usually I'm ready to come home. <laughs> Can't wait to get home. And for now, at least, this is my home. And there's something to be said for the comforts of home. The familiarity of a, of a homeland. And for all its faults, all the things that I love about the USA. But it won't be very long. before I take a greater journey in the direct direction of home, and it too will be in the air, caught up in the air, to be with the Lord forever and ever. And most of my fellow Americans will not be joining me. Philippians chapter 3, 20 and 21, says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And there's going to be a grand reunion. The journey home will be long and treacherous, and I pray that God will lead it lead us safely across the border to the other side. But when we finally arrive in that heavenly home, it will be so great that you'll never ever want to leave. And that'll be okay. You'll be there forever. So I may sing on days like today, God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. God bless America, my home sweet home. But that's only provisional. And it's only temporary. Because this is not my real home. That one's waiting for us. And we need to put those things in proper perspective. And so I would challenge you to think about your eternal home and your eternal allegiances that are so much greater and more important than a U.S. Constitution. It's a, a covenant, a new covenant with your Lord Jesus Christ that will provide the roadmap to getting there safely. If you've never been baptized in the Christ, named his name, and given him your total and final allegiance to be baptized into him for the forgiveness of every sin you've ever committed, it would be a good time to add this infinitely more important citizenship to your resume. And you can leave your American citizenship or whatever citizenship you have as a second-rate thing because you've got something infinitely more important. We hope that you'll think about that as we sing the song of invitations.